Dream Team, it's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. It's what you guys asked for in the comment section. So here I am. We got the Bhagavad Gita Made Easy Part 1 of 3. Before I dive in, make sure you subscribe, ring notification bell, give the video a thumbs up. Let's do this. The Bhagavad Gita is seen as the flagship scripture for Hindus. In just mm. 700 verses, we find a neat blending together of the profoundest wisdom and various philosophies within Hinduism. But unfortunately, many Hindus, despite knowing about the Gita, are completely unaware of its contents, often not motivated or perhaps feeling incapable of understanding what is being said. Oh. This short three-part series aims to present the key concepts that Krishna explains in the most accessible and comprehensible way. To begin with, let us understand the place of the Gita within Hindu scripture as a whole. The Vedas are seen in principle as the highest authority and have been divided into the Rig, Sama, Yajur and Atharva. Each of the Vedas can loosely be divided further into two general sections. One is the Karmakanda, which is made of hymns and instructions centered around the Vedic ritual known as the Yajna. This is where the different gods of nature such as Indra, Agni and Soma are worshipped to achieve different goals. The other section of the Veda is the Jnanakanda. This is primarily based on texts known as the Upanishads and here we find various teachings and truths outlining the metaphysical relationship between Atman, the Self and Brahman, the Supreme Reality. The Vedas were divided up by Sage Vyasa who also composed the great work known as the Mahabharata, which is an embellished record of historical events that took place some 5,000 years ago. Comprising more than 100,000 verses, the Mahabharata describes the conflict between two sets of cousins, the five righteous Pandavas, of which Arjuna is one, and the arrogant deceitful Kaurava brothers headed by Duryodhana. The feud oh, wow. climaxes on the Kurukshetra battlefield, where all the kings in the land are ready to start the greatest war the world has seen. The Bhagavad Gita picks up the narrative from here. The Gita contains 18 chapters and is best seen as being divided into thirds. The first third primarily focuses on an extended explanation of Karma Yoga and how this can bring one to true knowledge of our essential nature. The middle third brings a dramatic shift where Krishna explains his true form as the Supreme Lord. He reveals the beauty of devotion before showing his ultimate cosmic form to Arjuna. The final third is a further grounding discourse on various topics such as the philosophy of Sankhya, the three qualities that govern creation, and the relationship between Atman and the Supreme Being. Chapter 1 begins with Dhritarashtra, the blind king, who is the father of the Kauravas, anxiously asking Sanjaya, his charioteer, what is happening on the battlefield. Sanjaya, with his gift of mystic sight, narrates how the two armies are bracing for battle. With Krishna as his charioteer, Arjuna scans the enemy ranks. He sees his cousins, grandfather, teacher and friends. Suddenly he is overcome with emotion. The prospect of slaying those whom he has loved and served his entire life brings him to a point of collapse. He is overcome with sympathy and confused about what is the right course of action. I feel that. Alas, alas, we are bent on performing a most sinful deed by slaying our family members due to our greed for the pleasure of sovereignty. If the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, were to slay me in battle unresisting and unarmed, that would be better for me. I feel that, dog, because I don't know, just seeing everybody that you love across the battlefield from you and you're supposed to slay them how how could you do that to all the people that you loved and grew up serving he said if they were to slay me in battle unresisting and unarmed that would be better for me and i feel that because i i just couldn't leave like knowing that i slayed all the people that i loved all the people that i served all the people that i cherished and held dear I'd rather be the one slave for sure, so I can understand what he means by that. Krishna keeps silent for the whole chapter while Arjuna spills out his thoughts. Eventually, from emotional exhaustion, Arjuna surrenders to him in helplessness. Oh wow. Krishna now leaves behind the guise of a charity and friend and assumes the role of a spiritual master. 
Immediately, he draws Arjuna out of his emotional indulgence and into a grander vision of reality, explaining that the real truth to be known is that we are the Atman, the Divine Self. This Self mm. is eternal, untouched by the physical elements, aloof from this material existence. Mm. It is never born and it never dies. It is existing now and it will never cease to exist. It is unborn, eternal, everlasting and most ancient. It is not killed when the body is killed. Mm. Whether in childhood or old age, the Atman is unchanging. Just as we change clothes every day, the Atman too sheds and adorns new bodies. Every life is just one story in the Atman's journey. Arjuna is being made aware that beyond the body and mind, mm. there is a deeper reality, which is who we truly are. Krishna describes his philosophy of identifying with the Atman as Sankhya, which means an analysis. By analysing reality, we can come to the conclusion that there is the world, which is made up of physical elements. Yes. But distinct from this, there is the eternal divine Atman. While stressing this higher knowledge, Krishna also points out practical guidance. Fundamentally, Arjuna is a Kshatriya or warrior. His role in society is to stand and protect righteousness. His dharma or duty, therefore, is not to run away from his responsibility, but to rise and meet the need of a situation. Mm. Having described the nature of the Atman and the importance of one's dharma, Krishna criticises those who do not think of higher ideals, but mm. only on the materialistic and ritualistic part of the Vedic practice. So, <clears throat> I feel like I, I was born into Christianity and I was raised believing in Christianity and still do. Uh, and so Dharma is like kind of, I guess in Christianity we would say finding our calling or finding our purpose. I, so, and I saw some people in the comment section were saying like your only Dharma is to love uh, because I just couldn't figure out what my Dharma would be. Uh, but I'm like, it's tough for me because I struggle with thinking of like being born with the calling or being born with the Dharma because I feel like you should go out there and find, do whatever you want, right? There shouldn't be, you shouldn't, I guess there, you can be called to certain things or you can, there are things you might be better at, but if that's not what you want to do, I feel like everybody, whatever you do, you should be happy, which I guess if you're doing what makes you happy, you are kind of finding your dharma is what I assume. And you are kind of finding your calling if what you do, true, if you find what you do, tr you truly love or truly makes you happy. So I guess it all intertwines with each other in one way or another. So I guess forget what I just said. It, it didn't make sense, I guess. The point Krishna makes is that those who use religion to enjoy pleasures in the afterlife lack wisdom. Mm. Life and spiritual pursuit should be used to transcend material pleasures, not to revel in it in another life. Detachment as well as the I performance of one's righteous duty provides the foundation for one of the most important ideas in the whole Gita, Karma Yoga. You only have a right to the action itself and never to the fruits of that action. Mm. Do not make the rewards of action your motive and do not develop any attachment for avoiding action. I feel that you only have a right to the action itself and never to the fruits of that action. Do not make the rewards of action your motive and do not develop any attachment for avoiding action. That one's big time because I feel like a lot of us, we do things not out of the goodness of our heart, but rather out of some kind of motive, some kind of reward for whatever actions we do. And so I completely agree with this, with this statement, but I feel like as human beings, a lot of us without motive are probably going to develop an attachment to avoiding action without the proper motivation, which is sad to say, but that's how I think we are. That's, that's really good. I really like this that. is the essence of karma yoga, that we should act in the world without attachment to the results of those actions. This requires one to master the senses. 
Like a tortoise that withdraws its limbs, we need to withdraw our attention away from the outside world. Krishna points out that it is desire that entraps our consciousness, carrying our mind away, like the wind that carries a boat on the ocean. We have to remove this sense of I and mine, and thereby centre ourselves within. But going within doesn't mean giving up on acting in the world. Okay. Krishna explains that action is life itself. We cannot escape it. Even to maintain our body, we need to act. Our Facts. very breathing is action. Karma Facts. Yoga is all about being in the world, but not of it. Oh. It is not about external renunciation, but internal renunciation of desire. But if we are detached without any desire, why would we act at all? Facts. The true Karma Yoga Facts. is set beyond any selfish motive. He acts not for his gain, but for the welfare of the mm. world. I think I just reacted to something that some guru was kind of explaining, kind of the same thing. Uh, yeah, about like being willing and, and volunteering. And it's like doing it out of the willingness and to, to volunteer and out of the willingness to do it. Uh, not because of any kind of reward or any kind of motivation or desire. You feel me? And But... But he, I mean, I feel like desire can be good. He was saying like to like uplift your life to like, right? You desire, we as humans, we desire things. And that can be good to kind of go above the station that you're in in life. Like maybe you desire a house or you desire a car. But I think when your desires turn into greed or when, it, or, or when they're a bad thing. But having just desire itself, I don't think is a bad thing. But I understand what they mean in saying, I guess, don't have selfish desires. Forget about I and mine. Start doing stuff for the well-being of like everyone or the well-being of others. I can understand that as well. Or, as the Gita puts it, Loka Sangraha. This is unconditional, selfless action, untainted mm. by the ego. Okay. Krishna points out to Arjuna that even he himself has nothing to gain. He has no desires, but yet he acts, not for himself, but for the benefit of others. Mm, okay. The ignorant individuals, deluded by their sense of I and mine, believe that they are acting. But a true karma yogi sees the reality, that all action takes place in the realm of nature, and the self, the Atman, is not touched by any of it. Desire is the obstacle to seeing this. It blinds our vision like smoke from a fire. Desire invades our senses, mind and the intellect. The goal is to master ourselves through yoga. But this knowledge is nothing new. Krishna states that this ancient science is being resurrected by him, but was originally taught to the sun deity Viviswan and was passed down by different persons through the ages. At this point, Krishna famously declares why he is incarnated on earth. Whenever there is a decline in dharma, O Parata, and whenever there is an increase in adharma, it is then that I manifest myself. This mm. is the concept of avatar, that the ultimate personality, the supreme consciousness, descends to this material plane to destroy ignorance, to save mm. and elevate earnest seekers. Having declared his divinity and the purpose of his descent, Krishna proceeds to really pin down the difference between karma and karma yoga. One who perceives inaction in action and action in inaction is intelligent amongst men. Huh. He is properly engaged and performs his duty. I can understand. What What's crazy is that I, I do get that. Uh, that took a second. One who perceives inaction in action in action in inaction is intelligent amongst men bro i love these statements these are these are golden for sure what does krishna really mean by this karma is action that produces consequences anybody who is identified with their mind and ego is bound and constantly creating both good and bad karma through their oh. thoughts and intentions but to the one who has no desire no attachments and has mastered his senses, even if he engages in action, taking on all kinds of responsibility, such a person mm. commits no karma and there are no consequences to his actions. Therefore, outwardly, 
he seems to engage in karma or action, but ultimately, akarma or inaction is what is actually happening. That's crazy. On the other hand, if an individual who is not free from desire and attachments、mm. does nothing outwardly or inaction, he is still creating karma or action through his thoughts, feelings,、yeah. and state of consciousness. The subtle point being made is that inaction through avoiding our duty and role in life actively breeds consequences. In other words, our indifference and lack of intervention to situations which demand our attention will also give birth to future karmic results. This is particularly relevant to Arjuna, who is bent on running away from his duty. Krishna states to act without attachment to the results is yagya. Yagya is not just a fire ceremony; it is an inner process where one makes sacrifices for a higher ideal. In this sense, our yoga practice to gain mastery over the mind and senses is also a form of yagya. But what is the actual end result of this yagya? Krishna says that by detaching our attention from the world, by centering ourselves within, we receive jnana or true realized knowledge of the Atman. It is this state of consciousness that actually burns up all karmic consequences. We are no longer a materially conditioned person. We are centered within. Once you recognize the Atman within, you can see the Atman everywhere. This wisdom allows one to rise beyond any form of judgment and see the inherent unity that underpins all creation. The learned pundit perceives the same reality within a Brahmin endowed with wisdom, a cow, an elephant, a dog. And one who eats dogs. The yogi realizes that it is the same divinity that sustains all life, and so there is no distinction of higher or lower.、Ah, to become such a yogi, I like that. I like that. The same divinity creates all life. There's there's a proceed, sustains all life. So there is no all life, and so there's no no distinction of higher or lower. No distinction、ah. of higher or lower. To become such a yogi, we have to be detached from material desires. Then one is ready to enter into deep contemplation of the divine. The goal of dhyana yoga or meditation is to still the incessant fluctuations of the mind to realize the truth. As Krishna states, by constantly engaging himself in this way, the yogi who controls his mind attains the state of tranquility, which culminates in nirvana, which actually rests upon me. Mm. Meditating in the correct way, the mind should be like a lamp in a windless place that never flickers. Such a state gives rise to the highest joy and supreme peace, free from any stain of suffering. But as Arjuna says, the mind is more difficult to control than the wind. How is this even possible? In response, Krishna reiterates that consistent, repeated practice will yield results. However much the mind strays, we must repeatedly bring it back to the goal. Even if we do not achieve the goal in this life, nothing is lost. We will inevitably take birth in the right context and situation, which will allow us to further our practice towards the goal. In this way, Krishna makes clear that we are on a cosmic journey over many lives to attain the supreme. But who is the supreme? Krishna explains that among all spiritual aspirants, the yogi is the highest, and among the yogis, the one who is in contemplation of him. Is the highest of all. This last verse of chapter six sets the tone for the next six chapters, where Krishna dramatically shifts the line of discourse. Up until now, Krishna has spent most of his time on how one can go within and detach from the world. Now it is time for Krishna to explain and show that he himself is the supreme Lord and the goal of all spiritual endeavor. Many thanks for listening. I really like some of the ideals within these chapters.、Uh, they really stuck out to me. Some of them, some of them, I feel like I still, even though he was breaking it down, I feel like I still truly didn't understand. But some of them did make a lot of sense to me, and I absolutely loved it. This is awesome, man. This is a whole new world for me. It's like diving into the unknown and like learning. A different religion. I feel like, know what I'm saying?、Uh, so, so I think that's really cool. That's all we got. Make sure you guys subscribe, ring notification bell, get a video, a thumbs up. Shibodinia out.